Welcome back for another episode of the CIC Lounge. I'm Peter. I am Jen. <laughs> and we are going to be talking about this week's episode of Strange New Worlds, ep- Season 2, Episode 8, Under the Cloak and uh, Under the Cloak of War. Why? I don't know why under I messed that cloak, one up. Under the what? Under, under the... the Cloak and Dagger? No, <laughs> Under the Cloak of War. Um, to which I had to just do some background checking and look up that because, you know, every, it seems like every episode has the name of the episode has something a little bit deeper than just the surface of the name. Um, so I actually found out that it is a line from a quote from Albert Einstein. Uh, when someone shoots another human being dead, they have taken life. This shouldn't be made uh, excuse me, this shouldn't be made lighter by the fact that they did it as part of an army, a group, or better put, a gang. Killing under the cloak of war is no different than murder. The thing I despise about war is that under all its propaganda and nationalism and patriotism, excuse me, it's blatantly saying that a human being has the right to take another human being's life. How is a rational thinking person supposed to agree with that? Falsely yours, Albert Einstein. I like that last part, falsely yours, because we always put like sincerely yours, and he's just like, no. (laughs) I'm telling you how I feel about this. Well, it's, you know, I mean, I, I can totally see where he's coming from in that line, and I can really see why that line is prevalent in this the title given the content of this episode. Um, but there are times where evil needs to be vanquished, and evil is only going to respond to a mortal wound. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, and someone has to inflict that wound to stop that evil from spreading. Uh, so... I, I, I get it, you know, you know, one human takes the life of another, but there are, in my opinion, there are circumstances where it's justified. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I don't think that I could personally stand by and watch any of my friends or family being hurt. I think that it would trigger something in me. Um, I have never taken a life, thankfully, uh, but I don't know. I mean, I, I personally don't know because I've never been put in that situation, but I would imagine that if I did get put in that situation, I'd be able to defend myself or my friends and family. So let's talk about that situation because this episode shows kind of what it's like on the front lines of the war with the Klingons. Now, in the original series, this was supposed to be a four years war. Yeah. And it was supposed to kick off with the pilot episode of Star Trek Discovery. But Discovery sort of only did it for about, like, six months, and then they diverted into, like, the Mirror Universe. Yeah, they and got then, swallowed I mean, so, up into an alternate dimension. So as far as how long the war is and, and, and how the scale and size of it, we don't know. And when I had first heard about Star Trek Discovery and the Klingon War, it was going to be based around the Klingon War, I was kind of excited. Um I had heard of Star Trek Axanar, which is the fan film that that was doing the same thing. And then, of course, CBS Paramount sues the fan film, cease and desist, because we want to take your idea and do it better. <laughs> they didn't, by the mm. way, in my opinion. Um, but I was really hoping to see kind of like a like a war version of of Star Trek. You know, yeah. like the how do you um, reconcile this utopian society when you have a villain, a threat, whose only understanding is violence. And you can say that about the Klingons. Yeah. At least the Klingons in this time. They seem they don't seem to be as honor-bound as we've come to know them in the next generation. Mm-hmm. They seem to be very just uh, violent and an aggressive species. So I appreciate Strange New Worlds kind of showing us what that war on the front at that forward operating base really looked like. Yeah. Um, I don't know about you, but I was getting some real big, like World War II vibes, uh, especially what hit me was when Mbenga and, uh, Nurse Chapel were talking that the interactions with them, the interactions with Buck, um, all I could think of was that episode of Band of Brothers, uh, Bastogne, when the, uh, the doc, he goes back into the actual town of Bastogne and 
is looking for anything, you know, I, not just going into the town, but he's like running around to all the guys in the foxholes and he's like, do you have any bandages? Do you have any bandages? No, nah, doc, I gave you my, do you, do you have any, um, uh, what was the stuff that they poked themselves with? Morphine. He was looking for morphine. He's like, no, I gave it to you the other day. Are you using this for yourself, Doc? Come on. But it was like the what I took away from that from this episode was like the amount of pressure that they were under. I mean, these guys are all on the front line. They have no supplies. They have no uh, they're They don't know when they're going to get any support or mm-hmm. reinforcements or or any resupplies. I mean, Buck sits there and he's like, uh, if you if you need anything, we don't have it. But. I'll go look for it. <laughs> uh, to me, it ha- it was very reminiscent of MASH. You know, not the okay. comedy aspect of no, it, but, but that that front line, you know, you know, triaging casualties coming in, you do what you can with yeah. what you have and you know. I mean the fact that he's that Nurse Chapel is literally digging in this kid's chest, massaging his heart, keeping it going. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, <laughs> that was messed up. <laughs> um, so they spent, you know, so they spent a lot of time in this episode in these flashbacks. Um, I was kind of hoping to see a little bit of Ortega's storyline in in this episode because she talks a lot about being a, you know, her. She's one of the few on the Enterprise who was also a veteran of the Klingon War. But she wasn't a veteran of uh, of Jigal. Jigal. No, at least not that. We're aware we, we're of. We're aware of. this, But this story was about Mbenga, you know, and Chapel and their experience. And, and specifically Mbenga's, you know, darker side when he takes the serum and and Protocol goes 12. and goes after um, Doc Ra, I think is his name. The the general, the general at Jagal who become, later becomes a an ambassador. So that transition is really confusing Doc to Ra. me. Yeah, Doc Ra. So like... The Klingons think Doc Ra killed his men and then defected to the Federation. But in watching the episode, to me, it looks like his men were defending him from Mbanga and he just ran away. But nobody, that's the thing, is like nobody has any record of what actually happened. Right. So Ra uses this mythos that that the Federation created and the survivors of Jagal created that he killed his own men to push them forward. It's like um, the Russians, what was it? World war one when they were pushing uh, their soldiers forward. If you didn't go forward, you got killed by your own, yeah, by your own people. Yeah. So, you know, he, he he goes to the Federation and says he did this because he had like a, a change of heart and um the whole episode, like they you know, in present time they're they're playing with is he sincere or is he playing a long con as Ortegas suspects. And of course Ortegas is gonna suspect that because she has to. Um, somebody had to <laughs> well i mean you know and and like they they show it where he's like you know where he touches the the hot cup of rock de Gino and and you know he's like tenses up but he controls it and that's what i would expect a klingon who's reformed to do that you know in the heat of the moment he he gets angry but it, you know they did show i did like that they he kind of growls at the pain which i i've done before like Arr! but they kind of focus in on his eyes and he had that moment of like seething rage, but then quickly controlled himself. I thought that was really well done. So I'm trying to think, you know, you know, like this character, did did he see the war ending and decided to jump ship because he thought the Federation would be victorious? Because mm. in the in the end, I don't know that the Federation or the Klingons really won. I think they just sort of stopped fighting. Yeah, they you just know? had a stalemate and were like, well, we're just killing ourselves. You know, so like Dakra, you know, he 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 takes the he takes credit for killing his own men, which he doesn't actually do, which <clears throat> earns him the title of the butcher of Jagal. Um but why does he do that? Why doesn't he just stay with his own people unless he really did run away and and that's seen as cowardice? Yeah, and and, they, and in Klingon honor, that would be 
Yeah, you might as well just kill dead. yourself yeah. right then and there in their eyes. But nobody knew he ran away. Like yeah. all witnesses, like you said, no, there's no record of what happened. No, that's that's true. You know, now that you mention it, I'm thinking like, did he after this battle? Did he uh, come over to the Federation, or was it later, like months, years? Well, it's okay. This this happened like season one of Discovery, and we're on like season five. So if you're looking at the timeline, it's only been a couple of years since the end of the war, if that. Strange New Worlds timeline. I'm I'm not really sure yeah, where where sure. this, but it's only it, it, no more than like two or three years have passed since the end of the Klingon War. That's why it's still so fresh. Yeah. Um. So it's it sound that like. In the episode, it made it sound like the the incident at Jugal was kind of like the last battle of the war, like that that was the last front, you know. Mm. And and after that is probably when things hostilities died down. Maybe so so it, it would make sense that he would then defect right after that timeline wise. But then he but he did spend the whole war being brutal, not just to it sounds like. The colonists who were federation but also to his own people who weren't soldiers yeah i don't know that a lot of questions on this episode so, like a lot of questions about like the nuance of that of that yeah. character i mean nothing nothing against the actor's portrayal or whatnot oh, no, i think no, no, no. i think the the actor nuanced it really well um what i did one of the things i did find interesting about this episode is is what seems to be a lack of uh, mental health care among Starfleet for war veterans. Seriously. Mbenga has the worst PTSD when he sees uh, Ra come into the med bay. He's just like... And and he has it that, uh, you know, that kind of a response several times in the episode. And, and Chapel just won't talk about it. And Ortegas is just angry. And it's like... I mean, I get the the intensity of a manga because he he took the serum and he literally killed hundreds he, of yeah he went Klingon he, soldiers you know, yeah he went after he went after to kill this guy, um, but even so, I would have expected Starfleet to be a little bit more advanced in the care of their wounded soldiers because the you know living through that is traumatic is very traumatic and there just doesn't seem to be a protocol for coping with that trauma i would honestly like i feel bad asking this question or saying this i, I would like to hear from somebody who's been through war uh and seen really you know dark situations and, and been through these these kind of situations i'd like to hear from somebody who's done that uh their thoughts and their opinion on this episode i say I hate to say that because I you know it is something that's in their past they've lived through this and it's traumatic and I would hate to bring that up but honestly I'm curious yeah I, I have talked to a few war veterans um Iraq and Afghanistan uh, marines and and um army soldiers who've who were on the lines uh, my nephew was a combat medic in Afghanistan um so uh, they generally don't like to talk about it. No, no. <laughs> so, I mean, I get it, you know, it's... Yeah, which is why I don't want to ask the question because it's a sensitive subject and I, and I don't want to, like, bring up that shit with, with people, but I am a curious person and I'm curious. Yeah. I want to know. Yeah. But <laughs> I also so, don't want to make somebody feel really uncomfortable. So one of the interesting points that comes up in this episode pretty early on, you know... Pike walks in to like talk to Mbenga and Chapel's there. It's like we have orders for veterans to interact with this guy. Yeah. And and if and if I were Pike, I would have said, fuck those orders. Absolutely. Because I'm looking out for my people who are still very much wounded. The 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 pain, the the damage, the the trauma is still very raw, still very fresh. And there's been no time to really properly heal that wound no. and and throwing throwing this ambassador is like throwing salt on that wound and i i am really confused by that because in the in the pilot episode of the original series um the cage uh pike is portrayed as a war veteran who's broken 
you know, mm. and he kind of like he's struggling with with his command and his role and all this. So for him to come around and say like, yeah, sure, you know, kind of do this for me, like, no, no. You're, that's not looking out for your people, you know. And so like I, you know, give credit to the the characters; they do step up, they do try. Yeah. But I mean, I I applaud Ortegas for for her restraint in the dinner scene. Oh my goodness! You yeah. know, where like, she stood up and she's like. You know, it's like I. Then, you know, oh, that that brings up a good point. Um, I wrote it down when he says, um, when Benga says to Ortega's, sometimes you pretend something long enough and it becomes the truth, and that worked. That that works both ways with both Benga and Doc Ra, because Benga, we find out at the end of the episode that he is the butcher of Jagal. Mm-hmm. And he's been pretending not to be the butcher for all these, you know, months or years or however long it's been since the end of the war. Whereas uh, Doc Ra has been pretending to be the butcher. Yeah. A reformed butcher, but still the butcher. So it's like both of these people have been pretending to be something that they're not. Mm -hmm. And has it settled in? Are they really these alternate selves? And I think that's like the existential crisis and struggle that Mbenga is really processing. And that's what he's thinking in that scene with Ortega's outside of Pike's. I I loved the scene at the end of the episode between Mbenga and Pike where yes. you have like the, the different philosophies where, <laughs> where Pike is, is not damaged and can see the good in people. Whereas Mbenga sees more real. Yeah. <laughs> Or is more likely to lean dark. Um, and f- coming from the the medical character of a Star Trek series, who's normally the the heart of the show. Like yeah. they're they're the bleeding heart. They're the one who's, you know, to hell with everyone else. I'm gonna save this life of of this, you know, Jem Hadar or this Klingon or this yeah. Romulan or whatever it is. They, I know they're our enemy, but the right thing to do is to save their lives. And Mbanga's like, mm, mm. no. I'm glad he's dead. Yeah. I, I like that because I like the actor uh, Bab. Is his Babs. Name? Babs. Don't ask me to pronounce his uh, last yeah, name. Yeah, I saw his last name. I'm like, nope. I'm not going to butcher that. I already butchered his first name. Um, Babs is so fantastic. His, his voice and his inflection, I think, is awesome. And just the fact that he is so quiet, yet his words are so powerful. Mm-hmm. The writers really give this character a lot. Uh, the the actor a lot to work with with his dialogue and the fact that he has this quiet tone as he's talking to pike but he's like i didn't start the fight but i'm glad he's dead i was like oh shit (laughs) it's a it's a level of honesty that we're not used to seeing in star trek i I mean we're used we're used to seeing like this you know plastic smile put on a happy face you know do the right thing you know we're starfleet this is a utopian (laughs) society and and that's what gene roddenberry wanted when he created star trek he wanted the conflict to all be external he didn't want the conflict to be with the central characters uh because he wanted humans to have been at to have reached a point beyond that but as far as storytelling goes it's it's far more interesting (laughs) When characters are flawed, when your principal oh, uh, characters are flawed, when 100%. you can see yourself and, and relate to what the character is going through, it 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 resonates more. Which is what I you know I I appreciate the writers today really giving us that in these characters in Strange New Worlds. Absolutely agreed with that. I mean, you kind of have to at this point with with this uh overall show not just strange new worlds but the entirety of star trek you know we did we've grown up with this utopian society where everybody's perfect and everybody's good and blah 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 blah. i do like with picard you see that darker side of the federation um and with strange new worlds and even with a little bit of discovery you see the underbelly um section 31 Mm-hmm. and the the um ai ships yeah that was that was a pretty cool couple of episodes but it yeah no it's just getting to see the real raw energy of humanity with this season i've just been really really enjoying so 
I have had a lot to say about episodes of Discovery. I've had a lot to say, <laughs> not kindly either, uh, about Star Trek Picard. I am just in heaven with Strange New Worlds. <laughs> like, even though I don't think there's been enough Pike this season, oh. like, the story, the writing, I mean, writers, you keep striking, man, because you deserve that paycheck oh absolutely like, keep on striking until you get what you're y'all uh, y'all are this crushing it with this season yes but yeah um, i mean actors too they're they're killing oh, it yeah, across absolutely. The board. <laughs> but normally it starts with the writing if, it, if it's not on the page it's not on the stage so uh, an actor can only do so much if the writing is terrible no matter how good the actor is if, <laughs> you have the best if, actor in the world but if the script is crap then exactly so it starts with the writing and and it's just been top notch yeah like I, I i my notes for this episode are so so few uh, my notes are basically the the albert einstein quote and then what mbenga said because the those i thought those were really powerful and you know what going back and watching it because i watched it last night and then once i finally got home from work this afternoon i watched it again and i'm like i i was picking up the subtleties and that's that's one of the things i love about mbenga's character and what babs does is he gives so much nuance and there's so many subtle uh mm -hmm nods and motions and twitches that he does that if you're not paying attention you don't fully understand him yeah and i just think he's such a good actor and he's doing such a great job with his character uh, i i would have loved to have seen more of what happened on jagal um because you know what was that the second episode of the season third episode of the season when mbenga and chapel both take the serum we never see Chapel take the serum, so did she have to fight her way out of right. the camp? Right. Like, did she go back and, and try and rescue him? It's almost like they could do a whole series on the Klingon War. What? No. <laughs> I wonder if we're ever going to discover that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that was bad. I'll see myself out. <laughs> <laughs> you're not wrong like come on I, you know like it's it's really compelling you know because they ds9 um did this during the dominion war hmm. you know where there there was an episode where you're on the front lines where you're at some forward operating base and of course that's 1990s star trek so it's it's clean -er. yeah. um it <laughs> by star trek standards it's messy but it's it's way cleaner than war actually is yeah um and so i really felt like um they did a good job capturing the reality and the intensity of what it's like to operate on the front lines. Even, even the dialogue and language they were using outside the wire or FOB forward operating base, you know, using that lingo uh, that our military uses today um, really gave it a visceral and real feeling. Yeah. And there's a lot of drama there. And, and I, like I said, when discovery came out, I really wanted to see how you reconcile a utopian society at war. And we never saw it. Not really. No. And this just gave us a tease, and there's like, oh, there's so oh, much you so can do. Much. Like, I would love to see a rated R movie for Star Trek. Yeah, and I don't mean like sex or gratuitous, sorry, gratuitous amounts of cussing or anything like that, but to give it the realism that this universe deserves. Yeah, you know, people get hurt. There's blood. I'm sorry, but you know people There's say also things, sex. And, like, and, and they can do that too. But I, yeah. I totally get what you're saying. I, I don't. I don't need to see gratuitous amounts of sex and violence and all that jazz. But it's like, give us some realism. Make it, make it real. You know. And I do love like the episode where um, where Spock becomes human. They cut it, but you know he's about to. He's like, what the? F yeah. Yeah, I, if if I woke up and I was only one part of my genetic makeup, I'd be a little pissed off too. Well, I know they drop the f bomb on Discovery all the time. At least they did in the earlier season. Yeah, I think the first season they dropped it. A Tilly few times. was notorious for oh, swearing. Yeah. That's right, she was. <laughs> there was at least once a, one an episode that she right? would be like, She's "Fuck!" <laughs> oh, ooh, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, so yeah, that's that's. Uh, all I really have, like for Strange New Worlds on this this week. Yeah, I mean the only other thing that I wanted to say was, um, 
I'm so terrible with names. Uh, the guy who played Buck, he did a great job. He kind of reminded me of um, Red from the Red Green Show. I don't know if you've ever watched that. Mm-hmm. It's it's an older, like, late 90s, mid to late 90s uh, Canadian comedy show. It's hilarious. The guy uses duct tape to fix and build everything. Um, but he kind of had that voice and demeanor. But he says uh, Bills and Bows. Which I, I looked that up because I've heard that before and I couldn't remember what it's from, but it's it's an old English uh, battle cry calling your um, spearmen and your your archers to the ready. Uh, I guess Bills is a type of spear and obviously bow is right. you know, archers. So I thought that was kind of cool. You know, it's it's another thing that that these writers are doing is is incorporating um stuff from our history yes but i also wonder it's the 23rd century (laughs) what would would the vernacular still hold true exactly so many years in the future it's a good point but it's a very good point yeah but it is kind of bills and bows uh is is a military uh call to arms so i mean maybe it does I don't know. You were in the military. Did anybody ever yell? I never heard that term. But you were in the Navy, but too. But I was in the so. Navy, so it was very different vernacular used yeah. in the Navy versus other branches of the military. So if anybody who's watching or listening to us, if you were in the military, specifically, say, the Marines or the Army, um, hit us up in the comments and let us know if Bills and Bows is still used. So we've got two episodes left. Uh, and the next two. one's a musical. Shh. You see. Yes, but they may not know. Well, spoilers. (laughs) Anyway, um, (laughs) they've been hinting about the Gorn all season. Oh my! Oh, that I almost forgot the the Med Bay when he when Benga is working on on. uh, uh, Yeah, I was getting a very Terminator AI. Oh, absolutely, the bio bed (laughs) too. I was like, when when he's first talking about it, I'm like, "Hmm." is this just a a a nod to the broken episode as a parallel to Mbenga, or are we actually seeing like some sort of weird AI? One hundred percent. There's something's gonna happen in the last episode because because it did end on the bio bed. It didn't said a security alert. Yeah. So. uh, (laughs) Oh, one hundred percent. Something's gonna happen. I, I. They've been building up the Gorn all season. Yeah. It, something's something's going to happen. There's only two episodes left. But it's, it, it, obviously it's going to be a cliffhanger episode, the last mm-hmm. episode. And we do know there's supposed to be a season three, but it hasn't gone into production, which means it won't go into production until this strike is resolved. So really? So studios, please. Start paying your people. Get to the fucking table and negotiate. Yeah. or Otherwise, you're... I don't know what yeah. you're going to do. Yeah. yeah, the but writers need living wages, as do the actors and the actors. Yes. Anyway, uh, I thought this episode was really good. Uh, it really got into the meat of humanity and you know war and PTSD and all that. I mean, yes. I've I've never gone through any of that, but I I believe that these actors did an absolutely fantastic job. It felt authentic. Yeah. yeah, it felt very authentic, very real, and. Again, having talked to war veterans who have been in the thick of it, and I wasn't myself. I was safely aboard an aircraft carrier, but um, but it it's it resonates as true. So, yeah. well, again, this season is still batting a thousand. So keep it up, you guys. I will try my hardest for next week's episode. <laughs> It's going to be great. (laughs) I love musicals. Oh, God. (laughs) Anyway, thank you so much for joining us for another episode of the CIC Lounge. My name is Peter. I'm Jen. And we'll see you next week. (laughs) 